we are now recording. Uh, yeah, so if this is not the talk that you thought you were going to be in, uh, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, um, we're going to be talking about Backstop.js, we're going to be talking about visual regression testing. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, this is me. Well, that's the top of my head. Uh, I'm Ryan Bateman. I am a Drupal developer at Hook42. We're a Bay Area um, a Drupal organization. Uh, I personally live in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, we're a distributed remote team, um, so I'm uh, a long way from home, and I'm very warm and uncomfortable and sweaty. Uh, <laughs> um, if you want to talk to me on the internet, you can uh, locate me uh, under the username Porkloin uh, on Drupal Org or uh, Twitter. Um, you can also email me, or you can go to my personal website and read random stuff that I've written. Um, cool, so here's just like a little bit of what we're going to talk about today, just a broad level overview, summary of topics. We're going to talk about what visual regression testing is, and why you should care about what visual regression testing is. Um, just to show a hands, like how many people out here have heard of visual regression testing, how many, yeah, okay, so lots of you guys, how many people have run visual regression tests? Cool. Okay, so we've got like a good sampling here, um, but we'll go over that stuff anyway, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about Backstop.js, what it is, and how you use it, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about a module that I've created that can kind of help you to build configuration files, um, and then if we have time, I don't have slides about this, we can talk about alternative softwares and where the limits of Backstop are when you should start using things like Puppeteer, blah, blah, blah. Will you yeah. post your slides on the session, or can we get your slides, or how's that going? Um, I don't have them posted anywhere right now, but I will post them on the session. Thank you. Yes. I'll do that right after this. Um, cool, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. So, um, before we get to that, though, we should talk broadly about CSS testing. So there are really four broad categories of CSS testing that you can do, um, and these are them. Uh, first is syntax, um, and this is just a really simple, like, is your CSS busted, right? Do you have malformed CSS? Um, and there are a variety of different ways that you can test that, including manual testing, going to your browser and saying, hey, this style doesn't work. <laughs> so. Uh, there's syntax testing, there's uh, project uh, CSS testing, which might exist if you guys have internal uh, code standards for CSS that you're using. Um, and you can use a linter or you can use Drupal's code standards for CSS to um, apply CSS project uh, testing. Um, and then there's reference uh, CSS styling, which is uh, do your styles render as expected? Do, do, does everything look like it's supposed to? Um, and then lastly, and this is the one that we're going to talk about today, is regression testing. Um, after you've made CSS changes to a project, uh, does the page look like you expect it to? Are the things that are changed the things that you expected to be changed, or are there things that you didn't change that all of a sudden look different? Um, cool, so what is visual regression testing? We went over a brief overview just a moment ago, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, visual regression testing is in a broad sense, a category of testing software that focuses on identifying visual changes between iterations or versions of a website or a piece of software. This doesn't necessarily have to be a website. This could apply to all sorts of things. This could apply to uh, an illustration. If you want to do versioning on an illustration, you could use visual regression testing software to do that. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's not restricted to websites, but that's what we're going to kind of be talking about it in the context of websites in Drupal today. Um, if you are familiar with the idea of a diff, um, we have a diff here, right? We have a base text string that says, hello, Texas Camp 2018, nice to meet you. Um, and then we have a new version which has been Texasified. It says, howdy, Texas Camp. I'm, I'm not good at, at the, the Texas uh, accent. Uh, so I'm just gonna say it like I normally would. Howdy, Texas Camp 2018. It's a pleasure making your acquaintance. So right, the areas that have changed are uh, highlighted, the areas that haven't, um, remain unhighlighted, right? So this is a really quick visual illustration of what has changed between these two strings of text. So if you're familiar with the idea of a text diff, then you'll very easily understand the idea of a visual regression test as a testing system for comparing visual diffs. And here we actually have a screenshot from Backstop.js's uh, uh, report tool that shows on the left the original uh, image, on the right, or in the middle, the uh, changed image, and then on the right, the uh, uh, version that has highlighted all the changes. Um, so this was just as simple as, oh, we made the breadcrumbs appear, and we changed the color of the text. And then it turns into this beautiful fuchsia nightmare, <laughs> um, which uh, really does help. Because sure, this is an easy example. Most of you can probably say, yes, the middle one is very obviously visibly different. 
Um, so sure, back, backstop and visual regression testing might not help us a lot here, but in a lot of different pages, it really starts to accumulate and you really start to notice the impact. Um, and you might ask yourself right now, yeah, but, but why? Why do we really need to do this, right? Um, how many people out there have done just manual regression testing? Like you make some CSS changes and you're like, let's make sure it worked. Anyone who's ever done CSS should have their hand up, right? <laughs> you don't just make a change and then push it, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so the reason why we do this is because why we do visual regression testing and automated testing in general is because with manual testing, we already do this, but we do it poorly and we do it slowly. Um, manual testing really starts to hit a wall um, after you get maybe one page <laughs> on a website or something like that. Um, uh, so here's just a simple sort of illustration of that, right? So a lot of people will maybe remember these sorts of games from when you're a kid. Uh, spot the difference, you have two images and there's a slight difference between the two images. So um, just take a minute, take a look at the photo. Some of you may catch it really, really quickly. Um, some of you others may not. Does anybody see it? On the left, there's an extra pole hanging out uh, from one of the building towers. Oh yeah, there is. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, I, I saw something completely different in terms of changes. Yeah, does anybody else have one that they see? Um, extra window on the right. Okay, I also didn't see that one. <laughs> um, any others? There's four windows in the tower on the left and only two windows in the tower on the right. Yeah, okay, perfect. There's something red on Luffy's uh, pants or whatever. Next to the hand. Oh, yeah. <coughs> There's a patch or something red that's on this hand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, any others? Yeah. I, I, there may be more in here. I, honestly, I, have, I don't think that I know all of the ones in here. But none of us probably look at this and immediately say, I know everything that's different about these two images. And that's just a fundamental part of human psyche, right? This is something that's a perceptual phenomenon called change blindness, and it's documented. This is real. Um, it's when a perceptual, or it's a perceptual phenomenon that occurs when a change in a visual stimulus is introduced and the observer does not notice it. Um, this happens to us all the time and it, it, it happens a lot when you're looking at something repeatedly and, and you start to get more and more familiar with it. Um, like say a homepage of a website that you've been developing for the last year. Um, <laughs> it might be very difficult for you to notice some minute change in that. Um, Put another way, we can say that um, breaking CSS is easy, but testing it is hard. So it's really, really easy to introduce a change that you didn't intend. Um, and testing that manually is really, really difficult. And this is a quote from Gary Chapon, he's the guy who created uh, Backstop.js. Um, I would say maybe manual testing is not only slow, but it's also inaccurate. And that's one of the big reasons why manual testing in terms of visual regression is really bad. Um, uh, your project manager would probably just say this. Um, do we have any project managers in the room? Oh, that's good. None of them are here. Uh, <laughs> um, if, if my uh, regular PM, John Wynn, is listening to this recording, I really like you. Promise. Um, <laughs> um, so let's have computers do this for us, right? Why, why uh, make ourselves do something that we suck at, right? Um, that's where we get to a piece of software like Backstop.js. So let's talk a little bit about what that is and, what, and how we can use it. Um, Backstop is a framework for conducting visual regression tests. It's written in Node.js. Um, it creates visual diffs and provides some really easy configuration and test parameters uh, for a variety of viewport sizes and uh, pass-fail conditions. Um, this thing on the left is apparently what is called a backstop. Uh, I did not know that. I don't know very much about baseball or softball, but apparently it's uh, what is behind the batter and it prevents the ball from flying off when they hit a foul ball. Um, so there you go. I, I used this software for probably six months before I realized what a backstop was. Uh, <laughs> uh, so just a brief of summary of how it works. Um, it renders screenshots uh, using uh, Chrome Headless, uh, Phantom, and Slimer. Um, and actually, I think that it no longer does Phantom, so that might be incorrect. Um, uh, and it simulates user interactions using Puppeteer, Chromey JS, and Casper JS scripts. That just means to say that we can have our headless uh, 
uh, browser that's taking those images do interactions like click on things, hover over things um, in, through a, a JavaScript interface. Um, and then it creates a really nice looking report for us um, using something called ResembleJS. I know that I've just said about a million things that end with JS, <laughs> um, but like many tools, this is suffice to say it's an amalgamation of other uh, popular front end tools. Um, so why would we use Backstop um, over maybe some other softwares like uh, PhantomJS? Is anybody in here familiar with using PhantomJS? Did anybody use it for visual regression for a long time? Anybody still using it? Okay, yeah, um, one thing, because I used Phantom for a while and it was, um, I, I had issues with it a lot. It, it seemed rather unreliable. Um, the configuration was a little bit difficult at times. So these, I think, are all the reasons why I use it and I think a lot of people do, are just because it's easy to configure, it's very reliable, especially uh, compared to older tools like Phantom JS, um, and it has nice integrations with JS task runners and uh, continuous integration systems. Um, yeah, and we have a GIF here of just one of the nice things of it. It has this really, uh, really, really nice uh, uh, screenshot diff tool that is really slick. Um, installation configuration for the tool is really, really simple. Um, it's installed using NPM. We're not going to talk about Node and NPM here. I'm going to assume that most people here have done enough front end work that you know what those are. Um, but you can insta install it either globally or locally. Um, yeah, so you could install it just, say, to a custom theme that you're developing for Drupal and uh, then use it within other task runners like Gulp, Grunt, uh, Webpack, whatever it is that you might be using. Um, or you can just install it globally and then it actually exposes a command line uh, command for you that's just backstop and it executes um, backstop commands. Um, and then there's a really simple con configuration line that you can execute in a terminal that's backstop in it, and that creates a, a configuration template that we can uh, use for the, as a starting point for our visual regression tests. Um, and we'll look at all of this and actually go through and do it here in a minute. I know that we're kind of front loading a lot of like jargony, here's how you install it and everything. Um, but yeah, that's gonna scaffold out a configuration for you. Um, and this, I, I'm going to apologize right now because we're going to go through what that configuration file looks like and try not to fall asleep, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be just a lot of looking at this JSON file. Um, but understanding what some of the component parts of this configuration file are will really help us when we go through the demo. So um, the first thing is that this is just a JSON file, so it's just a, a JavaScript object um, and a series of JavaScript lists and keys and values. So we have an ID, and this is just a, an identifier for our, our backstop test. Um, and then we have something called viewports, and viewports are actually just the, the sizes of uh, viewports that we want to test against. So when you create a backstop.json file, it creates two automatically for you, one for phone and one for tablet. You can see that it has a width and a height associated with it, um, and that's going to predetermine the size of the browser for those screenshots. Um, and then at the bottom here we have two uh, keys on before script and on ready script. I was talking about Chromie and some of the interaction capabilities that we have with uh, Backstop.js and that's where you can, um, in either of these files, you can put some custom JavaScript that does additional logic. Um, one thing that is re really commonly used with this is to um, uh, imp input your own cookies so that you can do user authentication. So if, say you need to do visual regression testing on your um, uh, administrative UI, uh, you can do that there. Um, and then we have a, a big section in the middle of the file called scenarios, and scenarios are really important to Backstop.js. Um, scenarios are individual instances of a screen grab. Um, it's kind of tempting to think of them as a individual page, but that's not necessarily accurate because you may actually take multiple captures of the same page. Um, so on your home page, you might actually take a capture of just the default home page, and then you might take one where you actually open your menu. Uh, so you could do a, an interaction element, and, and so that, in that case, you can see why they don't call it pages, right? It's, it's called scenarios instead, because uh, what it is is it's, it's not only a page, but also a set of parameters that are being done on that page. Um, yeah, so the scenario, it's a, it's a list of JavaScript objects. Uh, and it, it has a label, so a name, uh, 
We can give it a cookie if we want to. So if you wanted to have something like an authenticated user, you could do that. Um, and it has a URL. We need it to go to an actual web page. It's going to tell our, um, our headless browser where to go. And uh, we can tell it a URL that it's supposed to come from, a reference URL. Um, we can also have it uh, trigger a screenshot on a, on a JavaScript event. That's what the ready event section is there. Um, you can see that by default it's empty, so it's just going to not wait for a certain JavaScript event. But say you had some other uh, JavaScript code that executed on your site, you could have it trigger when that thing happened. Like say you were fetching some, some AJAX data from a, a remote API or something, you could slip in a, a console log event that you wanted to queue in on or a variety of different things. Um, you can also uh, give it a ready selector um, by default. This just, it waits for the document uh, uh, selector to be available. Um, but you could say if that you want to wait for, um, you know, the slider uh, element selector on your page to be visible and loaded before you actually uh, execute the, um, the screenshot. Uh, you can tell it to delay an X number of milliseconds. You can say, you know, wait a thousand milliseconds. This is useful if you have some dynamic content that needs to come into view or you want to just kind of give the, the page enough time to load um, correctly. Uh, you can hide certain selectors. You can remove certain selectors. Um, and then this is kind of where we start to get into some of the interaction stuff that Backstop exposes. You can do uh, a hover and a click on a certain selector. So if you have a hamburger uh, icon for opening a mobile menu, for example, you could say click that selector before we take a screenshot, right? Um, and an important one to note with that is that there's this post interaction wait section where you can say, say you have a, a menu that opens on a uh, hamburger icon click, it might have a uh, an animation that happens, right? A lot of people have this on their website. Uh, if you triggered a screenshot right after you clicked that hamburger icon, it would probably capture an image of your menu open almost not at all, maybe in the middle of its uh, animation. So you can say after the interaction happens, after a click or after a hover, wait 500 milliseconds. And you can sync that up with whatever your animation millisecond delays are, uh, things like that. Um, <coughs> One last one, this is probably the last one we'll talk about, is selectors. You can actually tell Backstop, even though it's going to go to a certain URL, just to capture images of certain selectors on that page. So if you are doing something like a component-driven design, like a, like a um, atomic design system, you could put in an array of selectors here that you know uh, are actually the components that you've built for your theme. And uh, that would only capture those selectors on the page. Um, and the rest of these, the mismatch threshold, if, you want, if you're getting false positives, you might bump that up. It basically says if there's a difference of X amount between the two screenshots highlighted in that beautiful fuchsia color we saw earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, so, oh, <laughs> we're not done yet. Uh, there's a few more things in here. There's, we won't talk about paths. We will talk about report. There's two different kinds of reports in Backstop. You can do either a browser test that pops open a browser window that shows you, hey, here are the things that failed, here are the things that passed. Um, and also a CI version, a continuous integration version that can work with Circle CI or whatever it might be that you're using. Um, yeah, and s lastly, there's an engine. You can choose Chrome. Uh, Chrome Headless is super reliable. This is one of the reasons why Backstop is really great. It tends to work a lot better than some of the older um, WebKit-based headless browser solutions that were being used in tools like Wraith or um, Phantom. So, uh, yeah, we will move on because that was a bit of a drag. Thank you for sticking with me through that. Um, I promise that it will pay off. Uh, we talked about almost everything in here. This is just scenarios in depth. Suffice to say, it's not necessarily a page. It's a set of things. Um, cool. So, that's awesome. Now we know how to configure it. But how do we actually use it? There's really only three commands that, that make up uh, Backstop.js. Uh, the first one is backstop reference, and this creates a set of baseline images. It's going to go and it's going to say, for every single scenario that we've defined in that configuration file, go and take a screenshot for each of the viewport sizes that we've done. So it's going to say phone, tablet, um, desktop, you know, ultra HD. If you have like extra scenarios or extra viewports, take an image of each scenario at those viewport sizes. And those are the images that future tests 
get run against. So it's going to diff that against the last time. Um, and that's what happens when we run backstop test. When we run backstop test, it takes a whole new series of screenshots on each of those URLs, and then it compares them to that reference set. Um, and then lastly, the kind of last part of our workflow is that we can say backstop accept if we want to uh, say the last set that we got from, from backstop test. That's the new canonical awesome version. It looks great. We're approving it. It's good to go. Um, yeah, so there's just those three, three basic commands that you kind of have to know to use the program. It's really ultimately pretty simple. Um, and we'll go ahead and do a live demo. Um, so uh, obligatory live demo warning. Uh, it may look roughly like this dumpster fire, uh, <laughs> it, but we'll hope that that's not the way that it goes. Um, I'm going to exit this. Great, okay. Cool, so I have a website that we've built. This is a Drupal website. It's uh, called Texas, Back, Texas Camp Backstop. Uh, I've used the Devel module to just generate a bunch of random uh, content for the site. So we have a, a handful of pages. Um, and I have a terminal open here, which I'm gonna make bigger for you. Bigify it. How's that looking in terms of bigification? Look good? Okay, cool. So I've already installed Backstop, so if I type Backstop, we obviously have it, and it's going to say, hey, you didn't give me any commands. So this is going to be just the simplest way that you could use Backstop. Um, I'm just going to create a, um, a directory, and it's going to be called uh, TXBS for Texas Backstop, and I'm going to go into that directory, and I'm going to say Backstop init. And really quickly, it's going to say, hey, I generated some shit for you. Um, <laughs> and we see that there's a directory called Backstop data and a, a file called backstop.json. That's the configuration file that we were talking about earlier. This will look uh, familiar. Hopefully nobody gets PTSD to the, the, the 15 minutes ago when we were talking about the configuration file. Here it is again, it's back. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have scenarios. And by default, it gives us the backstop.js homepage as our one scenario. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and replace that with this URL for my Texas camp backstop page. And I'm going to delete this and I'm going to make sure that it's in quotes because otherwise it'll yell at me. And I'm going to say TXBS homepage is the label. Okay, cool. And I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to run backstop reference, right? And you'll remember that this was the command that we run when we want to take a set of reference images. Right now we only have one scenario. Our one scenario is the Texas Camp Backstop homepage. Um, and it says the command successfully ran. We can see a bunch of debugging stuff. This prints by default. Um, if you see any red text, you'll know that something is not right. Uh, if you see just gray text and green text, you're good. Don't worry. Um, and so it, at the bottom here it says run backstop test to generate a diff report. So let's just go ahead and do that. We haven't made any changes to the site, right? Um, and we're going to run a test. And it does almost all the same stuff. It's going out, it's taking some screenshots. And then it comes back and it says, hey, here's your report. It pops it open in your browser for you. Super easy. Um, and it shows us these screenshots. It says, here's the mobile view. Um, it takes a screenshot of the entire dimensions of the page. So the mobile view, since this is the default Drupal homepage, it shows like all of our front page content view. It's a really long screenshot. Um, but yeah, it's as, as simple as that and it opens one up. But let's go ahead and see what it would look like if we tested something that it changed. So I have a custom theme that I'm running here and I'm just going to go in and quickly make a change. That's really small. Okay, cool. So uh, we don't have to worry too much about exactly what I'm doing here. I'm in, this is a bootstrap based theme. It was just something really easy to set up just for the sake of demonstration. Um, and I have a variables, uh, a less variables file. Um, and we have a bunch of stuff here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and change the background color of the page to something really obnoxious. Uh, I'm gonna do this brand danger variable which is set to some sort of red color we can see right there. Um, so this this page is going to get real dangerous now. Um, 
I have my gulp running. That's just compiling my SAS over there. And let's reload the page. Just make sure that the change actually happened. Oh yeah, beautiful. Okay. And so we're gonna run backstop test again, right? We've made those changes. We only have one scenario. It's gonna go out and it's gonna test it against that set of reference images that we created earlier. And it's gonna think about it. And then it's gonna to start to pop some red text because the test failed, right? So it goes through and it highlights all of these areas where it sees a pixel difference, right? Um, again, this is a really, really simple illustration of what backstop can do, but, and, and obviously anybody could look at these two images and say, that one is different. The, the one with the red background, <laughs> like, that, that one is different. Well, that's, I shouldn't say that anyone can. Um, that's, that's not true. Um, uh, in case colorblindness, whatever, but um, a, the, a lot of people can look at this and say, uh, uh, that is obviously a different, uh, a different, um, image. So um, that's kind of the basic use case for this. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides and we'll talk a little bit more about it and then we'll, we'll talk about some other um, more complex use cases. But just to put a little bit of context on all the info dump that I gave you guys, that's what that would sort of look like. That's what the basic workflow for this kind of looks like. Um, good news, it did not go in, up in flames. Uh, so that's good. So. Uh, the, the first thing that I want to talk about is a kind of scenario that we can imagine using backstop in. And that's um, that the ease of configuration and how quickly we can get this up and running. Like you guys saw how quick that was. I mean, it took, what, five minutes? And we ran a test. Um, and if you were going in and making some CSS changes, you can treat this kind of as a, a sort of personal quality assurance. Before you commit some changes, you can go through and make sure that what you're doing isn't going to end up with a ticket getting kicked back to you that says, hey, you actually changed the wrong thing, or th there were CSS changes that had Im impacted different parts of the site, whatever. So for front-end dev, this can be really, really useful just as a personal tool in your tool belt to say, I want to automate that manual testing that I'm already doing. Um, so we could talk about that more as a scenario, right? Like, it, we'll assume we have a junior front-end developer, and, and our, our name is uh, Gene. And, uh, and we work at a small web dev agency, right? And uh, we got a ticket. Um, our PM just gave us a ticket for a simple CSS fix. Nothing uh, too complicated. Um, just maybe need to change uh, the background color to make it slightly lighter on a, on a component on the page. Um, but this is for a, a new maintenance client that we've got at our agency. And, and the site is something that maybe we inherited from somebody else. And the site actually doesn't have any front end tooling set up. And, uh, there's definitely not any kind of testing there. That's um, definitely not good. Uh, also, Gene's PM really wants this done yesterday, so we want to get things done, and we want to make sure that we do it right. Um, and in this instance, we could really do something very similar to what we just did, um, which is before making any of our styling changes, we would go out and set it and take a set of reference images um, uh, from a representative sampling of pages on the site, so we can you know, go and just pick a, a handful of pages at random that say, you know, this is, this shows a lot of the diversity of content on this site. We're going to dump those into the scenarios file or into the scenarios section of that backstop JSON file and then make our changes and then run a test and see if it looks like we made the changes that we intended to. And as that, uh, with, as, as that kind of example, it's, it works really great as something that you can just say, okay, I, I know for sure that I haven't made a mistake. I've, I'm only seeing the changes that I wanted to see here. Um, but on top of that, I mean, because that's a really simple use case, um, you can also integrate Backstop into uh, other front end tools. Um, and it, this can really help if you want to extend your test coverage for, say, a custom Drupal theme to include visual regression testing. Um, so another scenario for integrating it into um, front-end tools would be that we have a senior front-end developer, um, and, and our senior front-end dev is named Casey. Uh, Casey uh, wants to build out a custom Drupal theme for a new client that wants a really fresh, nice redesign. Um, but uh, Casey is uh, really diligent. Casey is definitely not a slouch, and, and he wants to make sure that uh, we have a, a, a new theme architected with some test-driven development in mind. Um, and what that might look like is 
integrating it with a front end tool, right? Um, there are a wide variety of these. Many people like to argue about Gulp versus Grunt versus Webpack. Um, I'm not going to get into that here. <laughs> um, but I did choose two examples of ways that uh, a, a front end developer could do that, right? So in a package.json file that, that you might get with just a, a standard um, NPM, uh, an NPM project that you've started that you might see in a, a custom Drupal theme directory, um, there's a scripts section. And if you've installed Backstop as a local node package in that directory, you can just put uh, down keys for whatever you want your argument to be. I kept them in line with the, the backstop commands, approve, test, and init, um, and then type backstop approve, backstop test, backstop init, and those will actually work as npm run uh, approve, uh, npm run test, M npm run init, and it'll run a backstop test for you. Um, similarly, in Gulp, we can include the package uh, with a require statement and then use gulp.task to actually run backstop.js reference. The syntax here is different, you'll notice that, but um, suffice to say that there's well-documented ways to do uh, front-end toolchain integrations uh, for backstop. Um, one question that you may have is about source control. Um, what should that look like in a project like this? If you're just running this as a personal tool, I, a lot of times I might, if, if it's a site that doesn't have um, a lot of stuff set up or they aren't interested in having me um, commit the testing files along with the, um, the source files, I will just run it in a completely separate directory. But assuming that you are running it within a Drupal theme or something like that, um, the really important thing to note is that backstop underscore data is a directory that holds all of your screenshot files. So that can get enormous. If you have uh, you know, 200 scenarios, which is not unlikely for like a large site to have a lot of scenarios, that directory is going to be huge because it's going to be um, 200 scenarios times whatever number of viewport sizes you have and you don't want to push that around every time you uh, pull your repository down. Um, don't do that to your coworkers. That, that would be nice. <laughs> um, Backstop.json, on the other hand, uh, that really should be committed because that's a, effectively a set of rules uh, that other developers can use to say, hey, um, these are the scenarios that we're testing, you know, go ahead and run, use this to run your test. Um, uh, one other thing that I would mention is that if you have any other like aggregated test commands in NPM or something like that, it's nice to include, if you're starting to use backstop, to include that in that aggregated command. Um, yeah, so that's the general rule on source control is just don't don't uh, include backstop underscore data. Um, cool. So you also might be saying, great, uh, but defining all of those scenarios manually sounds really tedious. And yes, it is. It's super tedious. I've done this before <laughs> um, and gone through and said, okay, I'm going to grab a bunch of uh, scenario URLs manually from pages. Um, Backstop has a tool that does this, and it's a it's a crawler that goes across. Uh, well, Backstop doesn't have it. Somebody else developed this, and it's a command line tool called Backstop Crawl that you can use to crawl over a public facing website, and it's going to grab all the URLs on that website and um, dump them into a, a, a scaffolded out configuration file for you. Um, but I really wanted to build something that was that would work with Drupal 8, so I built a module called Backstop Generator. And it's a backstop.json generator, uh, configuration generator for Drupal 8. Um, this is the URL for the project. Um, you can feel free to use it, obviously. It's publicly available. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it really helps us to be able to grab um, and pin certain pages. We can say, I want this page, this page, and this page, and then also pepper in some random pages uh, with a predetermined number of random pages that we can pepper in. And uh, it makes just the process of building a configuration file a little bit less painful. Um, and actually, let's take a look at it because I have it set up on our um, on our Texas Camp Backstop site. Um, so if I go to configuration development, um, once the module is installed and enabled, there's this configure backstop generator button under configuration development. 
And the page uh, looks like this. It's a really simple form. Um, we have a few different viewport sizes that we can enable. So we can say that we want to have you know, HD+, plus, UHD, HD, tablet, whatever. And then um, we can pin a certain number of pages. So we can you know, add one more in here and say that we want, and this will do autocomplete, just grab, sure, that page looks good. And then we can say we want a certain number of uh, ad additional random pages. And I'm going to say I want 15. Um, and then I click Save and View. And it goes ahead and generates out this file for you. And it has a little string here that sort of tries to help people who might not know how to use Backstop or need some refresher on what you what what those first few commands are. Um, and it's all built out here. Um, and yeah, so we can just go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to put that into our Backstop JSON file that we generated earlier. And then we can run a set of tests on that just to see it go. They might take a little bit, but um, so I'm going to run backstop reference, right? So I've all I did was just paste that that file on there, and this is going to run for a minute. So um, this might be a good chance to take any questions. I know I've been just going kind of fast and furious. Does anybody um, have any questions up to this point? Let's see. Wanted to test like admin stuff. Yeah, so you can use you can use um, uh, a cookies file to do that to, to be logged into your site and then uh, um, actually uh, have a, a user session that's active and uh, go in and just feed it paths to a um, to an, an administrative URL. So yeah, and that's um, that's something that I, I kind of wanted to cover in this talk, but um, we're coming up against the time as it is. It's a, a lot to cover in one one talk. So yeah. Set it up where they have dependencies on each other, so like you go to one thing and then you have to go to another thing before that, like uh, step one, step two. Um, it'll do them in the order that they're listed, okay. and it does have a, a thing for concurrency, so it'll say you can set so that it only does five uh, captures at a time, um, and that's really interesting. And that leads us a little bit into the question of like where does backstops come up against some limits, and that's a point where it really does. If you, what you're talking about is wanting to do multi-page testing and then testing for like the presence of certain elements, um, you should really look at using Puppeteer. Um, and uh, an integration between Puppeteer and uh, Mocha and Chai testing uh, stuff in JavaScript can accomplish exactly that. And you can say, go to this URL, click on this thing, then navigate to another page, do this, and you can even have some things that you've saved from previous pages and use them in those those future scenarios. Um, so our uh, reference command ended. I'm going to just start it running and a test really fast. Um, we obviously don't have any changes, but um, are there other questions that people have? Anything about backstop, about visual regression in general? Um, we can take a minute and, and go through and add um, just uh, some specific selectors and maybe demo demo how to do that in the few minutes that we have left. If, oh, yeah. Is there a way to have the reference uh, images uh, come from a different URL that the uh, ones that are Yeah, so to do that, really, you just need to, you can you can do a few different things. So so in, in lieu of providing a backstop.json file, you can do a uh, configuration flag on the backstop command and that can actually take a JavaScript file and you can you can do that to construct basically a, uh, a dynamic configuration file so you could have a couple of uh, different environments listed in a in a, uh, a, a, a JavaScript array at the top of the file and then choose which one you wanted when you executed the, the file but no out of the gate you would basically have to either just do a big find and replace. I use sed a lot. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, command line tools in general, so I most of the time will just execute a quick sed find and replace in the file, whatever my local URL is with the remote URL. Um, I don't know if anybody here was in the talk yesterday that David and these guys did, uh, the training. I don't know, did you guys go into using Terminus with Pantheon at all to do that? That's what we've done in the past is actually use Terminus, because we use Pantheon a lot for our projects at uh, Hook42. And you can use Pantheon then to, to look at all of your multi-dev environments and your um, the URLs for each of those. You could use that as a way of generating the uh, 
thing. Oh, okay. I was like, why did this fail? Some of these didn't generate anything. Um, but we can see, yeah, all of our scenarios are actually here. The configuration file that got generated out of the module actually works. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I hope that um, if you guys are interested in using Backstop, uh, that you might consider using the module. Um, I think there are a lot of things that the module could still do, so I'm also looking for people who might be interested in making um, uh, commits or patches or even be interested in co-maintaining the module. Um, so definitely reach out to me on uh, Drupal org if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, before we finish up, I'm going to go ahead and do, I'm just going to demo one more thing real fast. So we can do a hover selector. This might, I'm doing this kind of on the fly, so it might not work, but um, let's say that we want to hover something that has, uh, well, if we do our mobile styles, right, we have this menu button, right? And it's class and navbar toggle. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say that we wanna click that selector. <coughs> so I just put it in here just like I would in CSS or in, uh, in a jQuery selector uh, section as well. And I'm going to save that. Um, that's almost at the end of my test scenarios. There's only one right now that has that, so we should probably see that in the the test results. It'll probably fail, but we'll be able to see that when the the uh, Chrome headless session gets to that scenario, it's going to um, go and click on that uh, selector before it actually captures the image. Um, other questions about backstop? Anybody have any? burning desire to So to learn install more. it locally on your theme, would you put it in your like package JSON yep. and npm install that way? Yep, exactly. And you can do just um, from your theme directory, you could just say, you know, npm install dash dash save dev or save depending on how, whether or not you want to continue, want it, want it to go into a, a dev section. And then, yeah, your other developers, when they pull that, that package JSON file, they would do npm install and then they would have backstop installed. Okay. Um, and then if you've written it into gulp tests, it'll continue to work. And that's really, I think, the best way to sort of implement this is if you, if you have a theme that you're... Um, distributing as a standalone repo, um, including it in your your front end tool chain is really really useful, and that's what we do a lot. So, what's up? You mentioned that you had uh, some ideas for additional things that the module could do. Anything specific? Or yeah, I think that um, definitely one thing that would be really really nice to see with this is the ability. Because right now all we can do is just pin certain pages. I'm going to try to pull up the the form again. Okay, cool. Yeah, oh, so we didn't put in a delay. Um, but yeah, we, we can see that the menu's open here. That actually worked. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's an example of how to just do a little bits of interaction. So you can click on things and whatever. Um, yeah, so right now all we can do is just say, here are the, the predetermined pages that we want uh, to appear, and here are additional random pages. I think one thing that would be really nice, I just put this module out like a week ago or something, just kind of a proof of concept to do for this talk, um, and something that for a long time I'd wanted to exist. I, like, I, this is a tool that I really thought should be out there for Drupal. Um, but one thing that would, I think would be really cool is to be able to go into each of these, or at least on a bulk uh, process, say, I want to only capture a certain selector. Some of those other things that you see in the configuration file, um, which we can look at again, like this selectors section, right? That's an array of selectors that we want to capture. So we could say, I only want to capture the header. I only want to capture the footer, um, or I want to capture the header and the footer, but not the body, right? So like being able to set those on bulk for all scenarios or just for individual pin set scenarios that we have, I think that would be really, really useful. Um, and basically being able to configure all of this stuff, all, all the rest of the variables that go into building a session would be really, really nice. And that's that's kind of the future that I see for the module. But um, yeah, if people are interested in contributing uh, on that, that would be great. Um, yeah. Other questions? 
have you registered like a, a Josh command or anything with the module? No, but that would be really cool. Yeah. We should work on it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, that would be a, a great way to, to implement it, actually. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but um, it'd be perfect. Okay, anything else? All right. Dynamic content? Yeah, actually, and that's thank you for mentioning that because that's something that I was going to mention here and I forgot. Um, so if you have dynamic content in the page, um, there are a couple of different approaches that you can take to handle that. Um, one is that you can hide the dynamic part of it um, using the, the hide selectors section. So uh, a, a scenario for that would be like you have an image slider and because the capture kind of happens whenever that ready event happens, like the certain selector is ready, um, that image might be, have already advanced to the second image in the slider and it pops a false positive fail. Um, you could go in and you could just hide the image uh, or hide the slider completely. That's in the case that you don't actually want to test that. Um, another thing that you can do is that you could use the, the um, Chromey on before script. That was, um, I kind of briefly touched on it. Um, you could use that uh, on before or on ready script to go in and replace all the images in that slider with a, a known mock-up image. So you could use a placeholder, like uh, something that's always going to register as the same size and same color. And uh, that would be a good way to still be able to test the component visually, but not have to rely on that dynamic content that might be caught at different parts of the cycle. Um, so that's just one example. Does that answer pretty well what you're asking? OK, great. Um, Anybody else? I think we're pretty much at the end here. This this does go until eleven or one forty five, right? No, you have until two. Oh, I have until two. Oh, okay, cool. Well, then uh, <laughs> we can talk about a lot more then. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, we could. Uh, we'll do. We'll demo how to do um, just selectors on their own. Um, so we'll put in an array of selectors. I'm gonna. Reinitialize this so that we just have one. We just have one scenario again, and so we'll we'll take a look at what it would look like if we wanted to do an individual selector. That's all we're going to capture is that. Um, and we're going to grab this URL. And so in this selector section, we're going to go ahead and say we want to grab just the header of this page. And I think that it's going to be the selector is nav.navbar. That should be what we want, but I'm going to double check. Yeah, nav.navbar. OK, cool. So let's run this test. Uh, and this should run fast because we only have one scenario now. But this will be an example of just doing that one selector. So you can see all we got is just that header. So if we were making exclusively changes to the header, we really just wanted to focus on that section. We know for sure that that's what we're wanting to run our, our regression tests on. That's a super quick and easy way to do that. Um, we can combine that with what we just did to say um, click selector. Uh, I can't remember what the name of it was now. Navbar toggle. Navbar toggle. Got it. Thank you. Um, and let's go ahead and say that we want to also grab the footer of the page. Well, and of course, it's semantic, so it's just footer. <laughs> okay, cool. So we'll run it again. And again, this, I mean, all this stuff seems relatively simple, but when you get across a whole lot of pages and a whole lot of scenarios, it really, really starts to show its value. Um, and so we can see. We have the footer, and it's it splits out each of these, even though it's in a scenario, it splits it out into its own uh, 
uh, section for the, the test results. Um, one thing that's useful with, with the backstop report as well is that you can actually uncollapse this summary and it'll show you all of the scenarios and it'll show you which ones fail. Um, you can also filter them here into failed, passed, um, all or none. Um, and uh, that's, that's pretty useful for sure. Um, and if we wanted to say like wait a certain amount of time, we're gonna go ahead and say we wanna wait a thousand milliseconds. Um, and I'm also gonna go ahead and sh hide the nav bar toggle. So this will be interesting. I don't know if it'll actually still be able to click it <laughs> if it's uh, if it's hidden. Um, so for those of you guys out here who have used Backstop, how are you guys using it? Maybe we can start a little bit of a discussion about that. Like, um, are you guys kind of using it like this? I know some people they test across a lot of different environments. They do a lot of things where they're they're fetching all the reference images from their live uh, or from their test and then running their test locally or things like that. Um, is anybody? I thought there were some people that said that they were using Backstop here, but if you're shy, that's okay too. I don't want to force anybody. Um, yeah? I mean, one of the things we have at Pantheon is an automation script huh? for uh, checking for and applying security updates. So if you do a security update, you should know multiple differences that's reference URLs. Uh, so as part of the automation script, it into the multi-dev you know, branch, applies the updates there, does a visual regression test, and if it passes, if there's zero pixel differences, then it just goes on and applies it to the site. Cool. And are you guys doing that in a continuous integration yeah. system? Yeah. So that's. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that that uh, space of running it in conjunction with a with a CI build system is where it gets really pretty interesting, and it's something that um, that could be really cool. And if you if you have a lot of uh, CI running on your your current systems, it, it would be really really useful for that. Um, yeah. So we hid that selector, right? <laughs> That's um, again some of these are just like little little things that you can do with backstop um, and being able to just do these tests and it's just dead simple. It just, it kind of just works without a whole lot of muss or fuss about it. Um, and uh, yeah, we could change that mismatch threshold if we were again getting some false positives, um, hover over things, wait for certain things to be ready. Um, but yeah, assuming that people don't have any other questions, um, I think we can probably just call it. You guys can grab some coffee and yeah. Um, I really appreciate all, all you guys coming to listen, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Looking forward to the slides. Yeah, definitely. I will put them up. <laughs>